Good afternoon. My name is Basil Considine, and today we are here for a noontime webinar, Writing as a Nurse, Policy Development. This is a targeted webinar where we look at a specific assignment in a course to talk about issues of writing and concern, formatting, phrasing for the genre as a whole. So today we're going to be looking specifically about writing about policies and policy development using an assignment from Nursing 655. Very briefly, if you're not familiar with the Writing Center, we offer free consultations to students enrolled in just about every online program at ACU. We offer webinars such as this, we answer questions via email, we give asynchronous feedback where you sign up for an appointment time. By the time the appointment rolls around, you send us a draft to look at at any special requests, and we send you feedback generally within 24 hours. And we also offer phone or Zoom appointments if you have questions that you'd like to ask in real time or to be able to ask follow-up questions quickly, as well as templates, blog posts, and other resources on the Online Writing Center website. Students sign up through the ACU Online and Writing Center's WC Online system. You uh, don't have to create a new account for that. It now uses the single sign-on, so the same username and password as the regular system. Uh, there's a link in the previous slide, and you can also get it through my.acu.edu or through a link on the Writing Center website. Here's a brief look at some of the related webinars that you might be interested. This is a small sampling of those that we have this term. Uh, because I myself am going on sabbatical this term, you will find that many of these are being released as pre-recorded lectures such as this. And that doesn't stop you from being able to ask questions or putting in special requests, just to send those to me beforehand. Something you might also not know about is that we have program-specific webinar guides now on the Writing Center webinar homepage. So if you go to that page and scroll past the schedule, see this tabbed area here, and just click on the name of your program. So if you're in any nursing class, that will be Nurse DNP, and that will show you a sorted catalog where you can look at a particular course number, say Nursing 65, and any webinar that we already have a recording available for will be there. And as we offer these webinars and record them, we update this dynamically throughout the term. So generally, by the time that you are going to be thinking about doing an assignment, we'll have a webinar popping up for it. We also have an APA course paper template you'll see me using later. Our videos get posted to our YouTube channel as well. And did I mention again that we had a blog? All right, we have several things we're going to run through here. One is we're going to talk about how to write about proposed policies and procedures in APA style. And here we're not going to be focusing on the particulars of whatever policies you might be proposing, but we'll talk about how you refer to the system at your institution. And when we get to the drafting phase, a little bit about how you might write about something you might be proposing. We'll also talk about the journal article discovery process, how to use the ACU library to find literature that you can reference and cite. We'll look at that specific assignment, the week one assignment for Nursing 655, and we'll finish with a brief look at drafting and outlining. We should have you done in less than 45 minutes because this is one of our lunchtime webinars. All right, so let's talk about how to write about proposed policies and procedures in APA style. Now, this is usually going to come up because you are either working on a proposed policy and you need to know how that's fitting in with your institution and how to format that in your paper, or you are looking at the process and writing about the process at a particular institution, which happens to come up in this assignment. So I happen to have been born at Newton Wellesley Hospital, so I decided to look and see well, what are their policies on proposed policies and procedures? And it turns out that they have these enumerated in the bylaws of the medical staff of the hospital, of which I've excerpted two examples here and bolded the particular text here. So for if you want to form a clinical subspecialty service group, what you need to do? Well, you need five or more active staff members of a department to submit to the department chair written proposed policies and procedures for the proposed service 
which shall set forth, and here's an ingredients list, organizational structure, functions, duties, clinical privileges with criteria, consistent with the policies and procedures of the department, the bylaws and rules of the medical staff and hospital but bylaws. So other things laid out in this document. And then it talks a little bit more about how those shall be approved and the service established. And they have a separate one for professional staff services, which reads rather similarly. Yeah, you need five or more professional staff members and they need to submit a proposal. It also needs to be a sent out as a draft about that and uh, enumerates things. And if you're thinking this re sounds a little bit like the rubric that you have for your assignments, it's exactly that sort of thing. It's saying, okay, a, for us to consider it, it needs to look a certain way. It needs to have certain content. You need to understand this is what you want to do. Now, as far as citing these, we have one question that we're asking really. Is this material formally published and thus accessible to the public? Because if the answer is yes, then we cite and reference it. We need a parenthetical citation and a reference entry. If it's not formally published, which in this sense means the general public can't get to it, then it's considered not formally published. And so we, you can refer to it in text, but you don't give it parenthetical citations and you don't give it an entry in your references list. There is one side exception. If you haven't seen or reviewed it yourself and someone else is telling you about it, then you would cite it as a personal communication because you didn't review the material yourself. But for the most part, that's a, probably not coming up here because you're asked to write about your workplace and other things like that that you should have knowledge about already and have direct access. Uh, if you're wondering why something might be formally published, well, let's talk about what formal publication means in APA style. If you have a Word document and you stick it on a website where someone can just go and download it, that's considered published in APA style. It may not be publishing where they pay you money, but it's still considered publishing for the purposes of citing and referencing. If it's only available on the corporate intranet, for example, or if there's you know, one printed binder that cannot leave the room, public can't get to it, yeah, that would be considered not published. And so no parenthetical citations, no entry in the reference list. And that's really it. Now, referring back to the early example, how would you refer to it? Well, it was something like this. According to the hospital bylaws and then parenthetical citation, oh, medical staff of Newton Wellesley Hospital 2017. Now, if you're wondering what that uh, note in square brackets is, this one here, and circled in blue. So this is just introducing an acronym. So you can actually introduce acronyms to refer to authors when you have something long, like say, medical staff of Newton Wellesley Hospital, which is depending on how you count compound words, either six words or five words, still a bit of a mouthful and it takes up space. So the first time you use that, follow that parenthetical listing of the author with the abbreviation the acronym in this case, in square brackets, and then you can use it thereafter, except not in the references list. In the references list, you'd still spell out the full name as you see here. All right, so what other considerations there? Well, one is that sometimes these are materials that uh, may be a little bit harder to spot. And so let's take a quick look at some telltale details here. If you can't find a publication date, just put N period D period, which means non datum. It's a Latin phrase, it means basically no date, not dated. Now, if we were to look at this document that I grabbed here, the first thing you might notice is that it has a lot of dates inside. When things were amended, things were added, etc. Now, those aren't the dates we're concerned with. That tells us when some part was added, but not when this document was dated. And if we scroll to the top here, it happens that this particular one doesn't have a date listed there. But if you look at the very top of this, at the title of the file itself, it actually tells us. These are the bylaws from 
2017. All right, so there we have that the publication year for this it happens to be 2017. And in the references entry for this, we give the direct link to it. So that tells the reader, oh, if I want to go read the rest of it, that's where I go. Now, suppose it's not something that you can just find on the internet. And I should say that Newton Wellesley Hospital is a old hospital in New England. There's lots of stuff where they have or perhaps a little bit more uh, forward thinking with putting things online and using that as a means of distributing things. But not every institution does that. Not every institution is large enough where that seems to make a lot of sense for them. So you might be referring to the, the policies or rules or procedures with the phrase such as, according to my hospital's internally posted rules, according to my workplace's internal policy of policies, or say the Invert Grove Community Health Clinic's internal policy and procedure for new policies, etc. And you wouldn't put a reference entry there. All right, so the journal article discovery process. This is something where, depending on your prior coursework, you may be very familiar with library searches, or you may be less familiar with looking for specific types of things, especially for an assignment like this, which kind of uh, empowers you to go to the library, but also you know, lets you have a lot of latitude in what you're finding. So I'm going to suggest three sets of goals. Primary is you want to identify scholarly research that's related to your topic and assignment. The secondary goal, not essential, but very helpful, is if you can identify something that will be potentially useful for you in future assignments, like your dissertation or doctoral project. Tertiary goal, meaning this isn't the priority, but it's nice when it's there, is if you can identify an article that you will enjoy and be interested in reading. So note that that's not the main thing, so it may be dry, but if it does what you need, it's good. All right, now the search process is fairly standard. We go to the library website, in this case, acu.edu slash library, and you type in the search and you go from there. Now let's let's head over there and let's punch a couple things in. All right, so we're here on the library homepage. And let's say that we are talking about policy development. So you want to find some relevant research here. All right. Now because I want to specifically be looking for that term, I'm going to put it in quotation marks. And let's just throw in nursing and see what we get. And that'll load. And something that almost always happens is you end up with far more than you could review here. In this case, we have more than 50,000 results. That is a lot. <laughs> that is more than any person should be reading for one assignment like this. So that's why we're going to get more specific. We're going to add what we call limitations and delimitations on the search. So one of these is we're going to restrict this to full text so we could be able to read it immediately. Another thing, this next checkbox on the lower left-hand side, we're going to make it limit only to scholarly peer-reviewed journal articles. And you can see that, okay, that's dropped it to 32,000. That's still a lot. Now, let's go ahead and limit this to last five years. So I'll punch in 2017 here. And one of the reasons you want to start out a little broader is to see, okay, how much is out there? Are we restricting too much? Now, we still have 8,000 choices. So that's a lot. I think we can limit it further and thus make it more likely that you can count this as recent research and other assignments down the line. And when you're working on your doctoral project, should you reuse this? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in 2019 here. And we still have almost 5,000. Great. So next thing I want to do is to filter by geography. We're going to limit this to the United States because while things going on in Jordan and Ghana, I'm sure are very interesting and will have some lessons for us. We're particularly interested in uh, things that relevant to the, are relevant to the context that we're working in. 
So, for example, if you were a school nurse, you might look at this one and say, oh, well, <laughs> uh, something about asthma care in U.S. public schools, yes. Or if you're working on something related to the opioid crisis, you might be heading towards that one. Now, the exact article here doesn't matter for us as far as you're understanding the general process by which you would be searching. Now, I want to point out that we have our Ask a Librarian function here. So if it's during business hours, you can get them here in text chat and ask your questions and get responses in real time, including, hey, I'm looking for this. I'm not finding what I'm looking for. Help. And they will respond and give you help. If it's outside of those business hours where there's someone at the desk, then what will happen is you'll just send an email and then they'll email you back when someone's in the office next. Okay, now you see that our combination of restrictions has dropped us to 140 results, which is a whole lot more manageable than, say, 50,000, which is where we're starting. And you could even try and add additional things here. Let's say that you are very interested in gerontology and working in that kind of setting. Well, let's see what we have here. All right, so let's broadened it a little bit. But we're also seeing at the top, oh, things that, uh, oh, hey, yes, that is a very important thing in this last year and a half it's demonstrated. So there, there's ways of narrowing it further depending on the interest or the practice area that you're in. But I'll point out here that this site button allows you to copy and paste the information here. And it's not perfect. This is going to need some small modifications here. But it does save a lot of time in uh, not having to type this all up yourself. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going to grab a copy of our APA course paper template. And we're going to start talking about how some of these things are going to fit together. Don't worry, we'll come back and look at the specific assignment. But I want to illustrate one of the principles here. All right, we have here a blank copy of our APA course paper template. And we'll just take this placeholder text out. And we'll take out the placeholder references. And I'm just going to copy and paste the text that I copied. Now, you have a few options. I'm just going to do the paste here. And let's see what it looks like. Now you can see that immediately that's not something we want. It's bulleted format. It's got a different font. So we'll go ahead and mouse over and select match destination formatting. All right, we still need to undo the bullet, but that's felt relatively easy. Just select these and click on that. And if I go ahead and I go to the styles pane, I can select the APA reference style. There. Now, looking at this, there are just a couple things that we want to make sure get taken care of when you're copying from a database. So the database formatting is done by algorithm, and it's not perfect at converting it. It kind of depends on how much has been reviewed and what format I got things on in the first place. Now, the titles of journal articles should be written in sentence case in your references list, sentence case being the same way you capitalize a sentence normally. So fortunately, there's a handy dandy function that will usually make this faster. So select the text, change case, I'll just set it to lowercase there. And ta-da, that took literally a second. So that's one thing that needed fixing. The other is that this is a journal article, and we have the name of the journal, and we have the page range. We don't have volume or issue information. All right, well, let's head back to our search results and take a look at this. Now, if we go ahead and uh, actually open up the article here, we can look around and in this case, I've got the DOI here. So I'm just going to look that up.
And so this brings us to the journal website, and I can look at it and say, oh, this was actually just published. Okay, so that might explain why there's not a uh, volume or issue number yet. If this is an advanced publication or something, uh, it may not have been assigned one. Or there are some journals that actually, if they're electronic only, have decided not to use volume and issue numbers at all, which is less common, but if it's the case, then it's the case. Now, if I collapse this here to look, you see, oh wait, that is volume seven. Okay, so we have the missing information we needed. There's no issue info being given here, uh, but let's just check the site here. Uh, nope. No, that's fine. All right, so we've done our due diligence. It looked like there was some missing info and we checked and saw that, uh, yes, there is in fact a volume number here. So that volume number gets italicized. And if you were citing this, this would be Saunders et al. 2021, because in APA 7th edition, if you have three or more authors, and we got five here, you always write first author et al. All right, so we're done with that part. Back to the assignment. All right, so we've covered the preliminaries, so let's continue on our way here. All right, so we're going to now focus on looking at this specific assignment. So again, this is the week one assignment one policy on policies or policy frameworks assignment in nursing 655. Now the description here be I've divided into chunks to understand the functions of what we're looking at. So it starts with the preamble it says, Oh, a, a little bit about what policies uh, are policy on policies, a policy on policies establishes an organization's framework for policy development. It establishes the process that individuals must take to write or update a policy in an organization. These steps should include the governing body that provides final approval, how and when they are developed, and the requirements for development. Now, if you remember that example from the bylaws of Newton Wellesley Hospital, it listed out exactly these things. This document also defines the documentation and educational processes, as well as clarifying what is a policy standard of care or procedures for example. So whatever is being spelled out, there should be a way of knowing what that is and what format it should be in and what kind of review process. So we have this assignment. Find your organization's or another organization's policy on policies. Write a 1,000 to 1,200 word essay answering the following questions. Describe the policy's hierarchy, like the individuals involved in development through approval. Include information about who is involved in the process of developing policies and what they do, as well as who has the authority to approve policies and procedures for publication and distribution. Now, if you are wondering, well, how do we find another organization's policy on policies? Well, we can uh, do a search online. That's how I found the example from Newton Wellesley Hospital. So let's take a gander over there and see what we find. Now you can search for something that's in your own interest. Let, let's search for policy development. And let's say, um, I'm going to search for the Mayo Clinic here. I'm not sure what will come up. Uh, this is being corrected incorrectly to police development. So let's put that in quotation marks. And oh, we have a number of things that are coming up here as well as literature about policy development that might be an interesting resource to be citing uh, but let's say that um, let's go for this one here now this is reporting on what happened and we see oh there are policies that are internal there was a working group charged with it. 
is led by the second author. In this case, it's referring to the second author of this. So that would be Dr. Hayes there. And let's see. Talking about what it did, some of the definitions included, etc. And oh, even a flowchart. So this is this is documenting the process by which a policy was developed. And there are more resources there. Let's take a look at their references here. Aha, we have a mission and value statement. Um, probably not going to include the policy on policies, but let's take a peek. Now, even though it doesn't have that, something you might keep an eye out is that in many cases, the policy, a policy document or policy development document will reference the issue and values of an organization. So when you're researching a particular organization, just file that away and uh, let's do some more searching here. So what else might come up? Well, one thing you might do is go ahead and look at policy proposal because this talks about the same sort of thing, but with different wording. Now, Mayo Clinic, I know it happens to have a uh, rather substantial uh, set of um, internal documents through their internet. The Mayo Clinic is huge. So this may be something where it's not available to us, but let's say we're looking for hospital San Francisco, say see what comes up. All right, so th this is one of those areas where you might want to enlist our research librarians using that Ask a Librarian form because they are experts on finding things. And if you're looking for something with those particular bits that's not your organization, clearly it's not coming up in these sources. So contacting our librarians will be a great help there. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to search for Brigham and Women's Hospital. This is a hospital that I'm very familiar with in the Boston area. Spent many an hour there. And let's go for uh, policy development. All right, let's try policy of policies. And so what this is highlighting is that there are many ways that th this might be called. But you can see this search here has suggested that there is a Brigham and Williams employee policies and procedures. Now that doesn't look like their website. So let's uh, try searching just for that. Whoops, that did not bring it up. Let's try that again. All right, Brigham and Williams Human Resources. So we have their employee policies and practices. That looks like something related to what we're doing. And see, this one has been divided into some different sections here. And it looks like they have it under that portal. So, you know, Many organizations will, will have all sorts of things behind a password protected portal. So this is one of the reasons why, even if you want to look at another organization, if it doesn't happen to be uh, something you can access easier or somewhere else, you, know, you can always turn to your own employing organization. And see, if we tried to follow this, we ended up going into the login hit loop. All right, so back to the assignment here. All right, so charged with describing the policy's hierarchy, the individuals included in development through 
the approval process with some details. Also, you need to go ahead and analyze the policy and procedure development process. Does it clearly set out the requirements for creating policies and procedures? And does it include things like process maps and document templates? Now, for the moment, we're going to jump back to the Brigham and Women, sorry, not the Brigham and Women's example, to the Newton Wellesley Hospital example. Because if we look at, at that particular document, you should now see on the screen, we, we see that, oh, they did uh, specify some things, like in this case, must be consistent with the bylaws and approval in accordance with Article 16. Okay, that might be helpful if you were doing this specific example. So we have the numbers here. So the article would be the first one here. And we jump down to 16. We see, oh, hey, we've got all sorts of things. The manner of revision, okay, things should be reviewed no less than every three, sorry, no less often than every three years. Okay. And the, there's a checklist and uh, talks about how the boards can be involved. Consistent with, they must be consistent with these. And uh, it shows, talks about the who it goes through. There's a whole hierarchy. There's a credentials committee, a bylaws committee, etc. Great, so it's laid out some of these things. Uh, does it give us a detailed flowchart? No, but it says, oh, here's where you go to next. So it has that kind of information. All right, back to our example here. Uh, now, a lot of these are going to be very specific to what you're looking at for how you'd answer this. You know, does it encourage interdisciplinary involvement? Well, I don't know. You'd want to go look and see uh, first, it does it invite input from outside departments or other specialties? Um, are they allowed to be part of that quorum that you need to form a group or to propose something? You know, is it might not be labeled in those exact terms, but ask yourself, okay, what does interdisciplinary mean in this context? And that review of the evidence, that's a very helpful step to have in medicine. All right, continuing on here. All right, you also need to uh, look at, okay, a discuss the process for evaluation, evaluate the thoroughness of the policy on policies. And part of that is answering these questions. Well, okay, what works well about it? What isn't? Now, if you were looking at the Newton Wellesley example, you might say, well, uh, it would be really helpful if it had a flow chart. <laughs> Or you might look at another one and say, well, I can't really tell what the process is. It doesn't say who to talk to next, in which case those would probably be weaknesses. And weaknesses are opportunities to improve. So you might say, well, we need more supplementary materials, or it needs to have a more graphical guide, or the text is hard to read, whatever the case may be. All right, so let's look at some of the general specifications here that are required. Uh, must address all topics listed above. Okay, so those are not suggestions, those are requirements. APA format, yep, not a problem. At least three references less than five years old and external to course material. Oh, great. If so you're doing the article discovery process as we uh, modeled it earlier, you'll be looking at things that are five years old or less. And then three to five pages in length, not counting the title page or reference. And then there's a rubric. If we look at this, this is basically going through the assignment with a couple things. So this is, I believe, area one, number two, three, and four. But what about this one? A concise introduction to present the organization in basic detail those are the policy on policies. So this is asking you to essentially write an intro to your paper and to the organization. So name it, tell us some bits about it, and brief on the policies 
like the the big picture view. Oh, you know, it's very clearly written, or it's outdated, or it still uses paper, even though uh, we should be doing this electronically, or whatever you choose to use in your big picture evaluation. So if we just look back here, we find that uh, this is something, again, as I said, that that first item in the rubric goes before the number list. So you always want to check the rubric versus the assignment instructions and make sure you get everything that's required. So at this point, we're going to be shifting over to the drafting and outlining section. And we'll just remind you that you always want to answer each prompt directly, especially because the instructions say that they're not optional, they're all required. If you're writing about things you've done, which is probably not going to come up much in this paper, but if you're saying, like, oh, I have worked here for 20 years, sure, that makes sense to use an I statement. Uh, use the language of the prompts as much as possible so it's clear that you're responding to them. And consistent word choices to refer to the same things. And let's we'll want to do a guesstimate about the approximate length. So if the introduction to the paper and the organization is a short paragraph, let's say a quarter of a page, that will leave us two and three quarters to three, uh, sorry, two and three quarters to four and three quarters areas of space. So that's suggesting that uh, each of these sections, paper describes an analysis, discussion, final evaluation, that each of those should be somewhere a little bit more than um, you know, two thirds of a page in length, roughly speaking. Uh, some might be a little bit longer, some might be a little bit shorter, uh, but it should be none, I would say, less than half a page and probably a two thirds of a page to a page is about right. Okay, so that's probably going to be two to three paragraphs each. All right, so for the drafting ink stage, we're going to go back to our course paper template, and we're going to start and we're just going to copy and paste things in here so that we're sure that we have a list of exactly what you are going to be writing. Now, again, if you have identified the bylaws or policy on policies or other name of the document that you're going to be using, and it's published, we want to add it to the references list right away. If it's not published, okay, then it doesn't go in there. But let's start out with the outline. So going back to the first instruction, All right. Second. Third. Fourth. And then uh, we have that last item. And where should that go? That should go at the beginning here. All right, so now we have a list here. And a helpful thing to do is to start formatting this so that you can focus on what do I need right now? And so find your organization or another organization's policy and policies. Okay, we can cross that out. Uh, in fact, we can look at this and say, okay, well, it's a good reminder of it, but that's not gonna affect our outlining. Really, the outlining starts with Okay, concise introduction to present the organization and basic details. And so you can start just putting in a bulleted list here and start putting in some things. So let's uh, say that I decided I was going to use a uh, so use Newton Wellesley Hospital.
And so as part of presenting it, you can collect some basic information. And very soon, just by answering these things and putting them in a list or two, then we have introduced the organization. And we also need, because of this, the basic details. Now, once you've put that together, you can go ahead and cross that out. So it's more clear what we're supposed to be focusing on now. Oh, remember, this is supposed to be outlining the paper. And so these are really subsets of that. And but we also need outline of major sections, which happens to be laid out with these things. You can go ahead and list those. And because you want to answer them in the order that they're on the assignment, you can just list them out. And here, you know, go ahead and start with a short answer. And then in further detail. And very soon, especially with number two, which has so many questions here to answer, you'll be looking at, okay, how do I group these together? And if we look at this, we see that this is really about the personnel. So you can say, oh, well, I'm going to group that into one paragraph. And so all three of these will be subheadings, you know, things within that paragraph. And then you can look at this and say, okay, well, uh, how do I break down the requirements list? What does it have or what it doesn't? And just make a list for that. Then there, you're giving yourself all the information that when you have to sit down and write the sentence, it will all be in front of you and so it'll be very fast. All right, I did promise this, this would be a shorter webinar because this is part of our lunch series. So let's just recap what remains to be done in the process. So after you have identified the organization that you're going to study, confirm that you can get a copy of their policy on policies, determined whether or not it's going to be formally cited and referenced and add it to your reference list if the answer is yes. Then you want to go ahead and take the assignment instructions and that extra instruction from the rubric and then go ahead and put these all together in our APA course paper template. So you have a list of everything that's required to be in the paper and then go ahead and start filling in. So, oh, here's this requirement. Well, let me put a bullet for it. Let me go ahead and add that detail in as I find it. And then pretty soon you have a roadmap for the whole paper. So I hope that this was helpful to you. We offer more webinars of this sort every term, and we offer them in part from suggestions from students such as yourself. So if there's a particular topic that you would love to see in a future webinar, send us an email and we'll see if we can add it to the list of offerings. All right, thank you for watching and have a great rest of the term.